line show is F. I want to thank you for inviting me. I have been um, an irregular visitor to uh, the university for, I think, five years now. Uh, and I regret that it couldn't be more regular because um, uh, every time I come, it's, uh, I'm treated as if I were welcome, and it's uh, quite a quite a pleasure and uh, I always feel that I'm a, among uh, friends. <laughs> I shall be what I'm saying is that um, is if you want to see in more detail I have a this year I'll have a book coming out called The Economics of the One Percent Concentrating Wealth by uh, Dispersing Ideology. It's supposed to be a general uh, book for the general audience, not just for um, uh, economists. <coughs> and if um, uh, you're interested in um, uh, reading a pre-publication, I would be pleased to uh, send you a version of it. Also, I highly recommend uh, as uh, further reading, uh, on, if you find what I say interesting, the Social Europe Journal, which is online, I think it's just www.socialeuropejournal.net, but you can Google it, where I write recently, and there's excellent articles on the European crisis from um, famous people like Stevens and Krugman down to, uh, you know, the uh, economists on the street, uh, such as myself. Um, also, I have a regular column dealing with these issues in a online um, media outlet called the Real News Network. Again, if you just, it's called the e Economics for the 99%. Um, Interesting. My next uh, column there will be on uh, the West Bank that I just recently uh, uh, visited. The economic crisis that began in 2007 or 2008, depending on how you define it, has many characteristics. On sort of a sociological level, one that many people have raised, uh, the Queen of Great Britain raised it. Why did mainstream economists not see the crisis coming? Why didn't they predict it? Why, why were they even months before the uh, weeks, really, in one case, before the crisis came, were talking about how sus sustainable the um, uh, uh, financial system was in uh, European countries and in the United States, and that it could go on forever. Second question, why has it lasted so long? But I think the short answer to this, kind of, we can take from Oscar Wilde, life imitates art from far more than art <laughs> imitates life. It's not clear what Oscar Wilde meant by that. He was famous for making uh, such statements in which it was for the reader or the listener to try to ascertain or uh, understand what was meant. But what I mean by that is we have a case in which reality has become a captive of fantasy, or reality has generated, a, uh, has uh, encountered a crisis which is the result of policies derived from fanciful analytical systems. I want to begin that by uh, talking about the neoclassical mainstream. The first and most fundamental point, I think, is that uh, Economics has a class basis. 
and I will uh, I'll try to demonstrate that concretely. And rather than elaborate on that, um, lest you think I'm not, I myself am entering into ideology. Of course, we all make ideological arguments, but the hope is that for some of us it's based upon sound <coughs> analytical principles. The neoclassical mainstream has a hypothesis. That hypothesis is that we can understand the world by assuming that it is characterized by full employment. Everything, every conclusion, even the most trivial in neoclassical economics, derives from the assumption of full employment. I'll give some um, obvious uh, um, uh, examples, which I will go into later. When are there price signals? Neoclassicals are uh, frequently talk about or endlessly talk about how the markets send out price signals. A market sends out price signals if the uh, recipient of the signal believes that he or she cannot affect market by his or her individual behavior then what happens in the market produces a signal that you take as something external to you and you act upon. So a price signal presumes that you can't affect the outcome of a market. Under what circumstances can you not affect the outcome in a market if there's full employment? There must be full employment because if there's not, if there isn't, it means that the action of individuals through their decisions to uh, spend or not to spend will affect the level of demand. And a change in the level of demand in general will lead to a change in relative prices. I'll come back to that example. Of course, international trade theory is the most, I would say, most notorious case of this, where the entire structure presumes for employment. <clears throat> the production price frontier, the gains from trade, all of this presumes full employment. We don't have full employment. I mean, that uh, may uh, strike a neoclassical as a, as a heresy, but uh, I think um, um, most people in this audience uh, would agree. So therefore, to construct a theory based upon the assumption of full employment is similar to alchemy right? as opposed to chemistry or astrology versus astronomy or evolution versus creationism. We can give a concrete example that is to say the Early astronomers, now they weren't even astrologers, though some of them were, <clears throat> up until the 15th century, all but a few believed that the earth was the center of the universe and that the heavenly bodies circulated around the earth in perfectly round orbits, that is, that the, the orbits were perfectly circular. And the interesting thing is that they were able to produce a, a algebraic analog such that this model would generate or would be able to track what you actually observed fairly accurately. So, it is possible to have, a, I might say, an accurate empirical, I don't want to say prediction, an accurate empirical tracking of reality with a totally bogus theory. And the reason the theory was bogus is because 
those early astronomers had no theory of gravity. They had no theory to explain why heavenly bodies moved around other heavenly bodies. And so as a result, they took the simplest case of perfectly circular orbits. Uh, you might think in this context of Milton Friedman and others, famous, uh, famous uh, generalization, Occam's razor, the simplest explanation is always the best. I would say of all the uh, principles of uh, economics which are pure nonsense, which are pure rubbish, that must rank fairly high. <coughs> But, in a sense, I suppose it is appropriate for simple minds. This leads us to the process of the marginalization of reality and the marginalization of those who recognize the world in the way it actually operates. So, any, over the last 40 years, any economist who argued that economies are not characterized by full employment, but they are characterized by unemployment, and that you should construct your analytical framework with an analytical progression or analytical, uh, with analytical steps that derive from a context of unemployment, up to some degree. <coughs> Anyone who took that position was called a Keynesian. So a Keynesian economist was someone who thought, uh, when you have vulgar versions of it, Keynesians believe that the government ought to spend more money. Uh, <coughs> Keynesians believe that the, um, uh, the government should be active, and so on. But basically, the argument was that, and it, it is particularly true in the press, but also true in the profession, if you thought the economy was not at full employment, then you were Keynesian. This has a number of advantages. One, it lumped everyone together who was not in the mainstream under one name as if they were all the same, so as if every Ricardian, <coughs> Schumpeterian uh, follower of uh, Minsky, Kaleski, and Keynes himself, as if they were all alike, which they are not. <coughs> a good example of the very major differences between Kaleski's analysis of uh, the condition of the economy under uh, conditions of unemployment and Keynes, uh, in which they engaged in uh, a, an analytical debate. And a good analogy to try to explain uh, or summarize the point I'm making is, what if in the astronomy profession, I don't know if Carter Haas, you teach astronomy. Um, I'm sure you teach physics. Uh, but um, what if uh, uh, in the astronomy department of um, the University of London, which there's several, that people refer to Copernican astronomers? That is, someone who believed that the Earth was not the center of the universe. Well, actually, it's redundant because all astronomers believe that the Earth is not the center of the universe, because it is not the center of the universe. I mean, uh, forgive me if that sounds trivial, but think about economics for a moment. We do not have full employment. Therefore, we should not construct models as if we did. But the mainstream does. Now, how do we account for that? That represents the class basis or the class nature of economics because the principle that 
we can, or the idea, the hypothesis that the economy can be understood by the presumption of full employment, then leads you to say there are trade-offs. If wages go up, prices must go down. If the government spends more, then the private sector must spend less. That the individual dilemma, you might say, is how to allocate a given income among competing needs. Of course, the income is given in the sense that is a decision made by the household of the distribution between work and leisure. That's how people get their incomes and then they have limited means but unlimited wants. Just as a semi-digression, not a full digression, digression, I would say perhaps <coughs> the most thorough, thoroughly pernicious generalization in economics that is taught to all introductory students is that economics is the study of the allocation of scarce resources among unlimited wants. Resources are scarce, wants, needs are unlimited. It's false. It's not that it's slightly false. It's completely false. Resources are not limited. They are limited in the sense that we can destroy the earth by not uh, being careful about the environment. But Turkey today, all over Europe, in fact, you're probably better off than most of Europe, there are millions of unemployed men and women. There are thousands and thousands of factories operating at less than full capacity. There are millions of people working in jobs beneath their skill level. What resource is scarce? other than the resources of the earth, air and water and so on. They are the scarce things. But the, but the mainstream doesn't consider those items. It's talking about capital and labor. They aren't scarce. To just say as a sign, because they aren't scarce, it means all of microeconomics is analytically wrong beginning to end. I can come back to that and uh, talk uh, and questions if people have them or uh, informally. All supply curves assume that the economy is at full employment. Otherwise, you cannot presume that the firm takes the prices given, and if it doesn't take the prices given, then there is no supply curve. What then is the economics of reality? First and foremost, output is demand determined. Now, the level, the maximum level of output changes over time. That is the result of investment by the public sector and by the private sector. But at any moment, the level of output is demand determined. We aren't talking about the short run versus the long run. Again, that is a uh, neoclassical concept which has plagued us throughout the history of modern, of, of uh, sort of, uh, economics since uh, Jevons uh, in, uh, in the second half of the 19th century. The idea that there is a short run, and that's what Keynes allegedly addressed, and there is a long run. And the thing about the long run is that uh, we can assume full employment. 
because the economy tends to fill employment. If you can't demonstrate that the economy, or if you can demonstrate that the economy moves to full employment, why is there a difference between the long run and the short run? The idea that the only difference is how long it takes is a trivial and analytically false answer. Because if it takes time to adjust, for the economy to adjust to what the uh, mainstream likes to call stochastic shocks, then it is always adjusting. Because there are always new shocks. The implication of output being determined by the level of demand. By the way, that includes the possibility that demand can be excessive. <coughs> that is, that uh, demand can exceed the economy's ability to supply, supply, though that is a relatively rare case in our uh, market economies. That implies prices are der derivative. Prices do not give signals. Profits give signals. Firms do not respond to price, price changes. They respond to profit changes. And then they use prices, they manipulate prices in response to changes in profits. That in turn is related to an inherent tendency in capitalist accumulation which uh, will get me to the crisis after reveling on for almost a, a, a half hour, and that is the tendency in a capitalist economy or market economy for capitalists to attempt to take profit without production. You'll recognize this as a famous um, representation of the process of capitalist uh, circulation uh, developed by Marx where you um, companies begin with money, they buy uh, inputs, they hire workers, that's the C, the commodities, uh, the first uh, C without the prime is the um, commodities or inputs and uh, uh, workers. P is the production process, you go through the production process, you create a new set of commodities and you sell them. So the C prime is a new set of commodities that you obtain by combining raw materials and intermediate products with labor. <coughs> Those new products then must be sold and then it starts all over again. <coughs> the effect of financial deregul deregulation is to approach a much simpler form of that schema, namely to begin with money and then end up with more money without passing through production. I think that a useful and perhaps the best way to understand the reforms introduced in the 1930s in the United States by the Roosevelt administration and in Western Europe after World War II is the attempt, and I would say largely successful attempt, to stop capitalists from using the second formula, it's not a formula, form of circulation, forcing them to go through production and the way you do that is by regular, uh, or the way that was done, how we do it now, I'll come back to. The way you did that was fixed exchange rates. So that the ability to speculate on currencies was extremely limited. Very strict regulation of financial sector 
So actually, the ability of finance to speculate on those fixed currencies was very limited, because you can have we could we could go back tomorrow to fixed currencies, but it would be unsustainable because you have a financial sector which can use its freedom to speculate on those currencies, as we have seen in uh, the case of the Euro and earlier as, as different countries were entering uh, the Euro. So the effect of financial deregulation is to render market economies into financial economies. Now, of course, there are other hypotheses about why we have a crisis. There is the mainstream. <coughs> I won't elaborate those. Those almost always take the outcome as the cause. So, for example, in both Britain and the United States, the argument is made that the reason we have a crisis is because of the large fiscal deficits, uh, government, um, governments going into debt, having, uh, having large uh, deficits, um, uh, both in current and capital expenditure. And as a result of this, um, squeezing out, discouraging uh, private sector investment and depressing the economy. Uh, I won't elaborate on that. It is, uh, I've written quite a bit on it. Um, I should be polite, but I won't be polite. It is nonsense. All of the conditions that are required within the mainstream itself to defend that position are not present. There, how can you have crowding out when interest rates are close to zero and real interest rates are negative? Uh, the idea that this can be explained by Ricardian equivalents, I'm, I won't insult your intelligence by pursuing the argument over about Ricardian uh, equivalents. Um, that is to say, somehow buildup of debt uh, discourages uh, the, uh, the uh, private sector, even if interest rates are very low, uh, and <coughs> other explanations. Radical explanations have generally focused on some form of a Marxist hypothesis that uh, places the problem in the context of profitability. Uh, in the famous uh, crises are caused by uh, the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. I think there are a number of problems with this. <coughs> I do not think crises are caused by uh, falls in the rate of profit. I don't think Marx thought that either, but it doesn't matter. If he did think that, he was wrong. I think that he argued that there was an underlying tendency in the accumulation process to devalue the capital stock as a result of technical change. And as a result, that made it impossible for private companies to realize, recover the value that they had expended in the production process. If you had bought a machine in the process of accumulation, uh, that the value of that machine declines because of technical change. A new, better machine comes in, then you are you must absorb in the price of the product the <coughs> decline in the ability of your old machine to generate value. And that leads through the financial system to a financial crisis which takes its, as its form a crisis of realization in the sense that there's unemployment and things are produced that can't be sold and so on. So that's my, gen my general interpretation. We can come back to that. <coughs> I have a recent book. And <coughs> 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 
<coughs> Excuse me, I picked up a little bit of a little bit of a cold while I was um, uh, in, um, uh, uh, on the West the West Bank. Um, the I, on the other hand, I fear that the um, many Marxists succumbed to the mainstream's view that everything had been sorted out in capitalism. I won't name any names for fear of being uh, sued for slander, but there are several very prominent Marxist economists in the United States and Canada who argued that there, uh, as late as 2007, after the conference of this occurred, that there could be no capitalist crisis because of all the hedging and all the new financial products uh, that capitalists have been able to insure themselves against risk. Uh, that was wrong. I think it's theoretically wrong. People should never have come to that conclusion. A close reading of Marx and many, many other uh, uh, insightful uh, writers would have told them that that was impossible. Okay, now I'm going to wind up in the next, uh, within the next 10 minutes and uh, link this directly to the United States uh, and um, uh, Western Europe. My basic argument is that this is a crisis which was the result of the excessive growth of finance. So for example, in the United States in 1960, the financial sector accounted for about 2% of gross national product. And the last reliable figures we have 2010, when that had risen to almost 9%. And that's probably an understatement because most big companies in the United States, which appear to be manufacturing companies, are actually financial companies. And there are a very famous example, General Electric. General Electric no longer to any great extent, extent produces heavy electrical equipment. It is involved in financial speculation on currencies, on derivatives, and the <coughs> financial equipment in the United States is largely imported. Why does, why does the crisis persist? I would say in the United States, there are two reasons. One uh, uh, comes out um, in the work of James Galbraith, if any of you have uh, read that, uh, in which he argues that the problem in the United States is a dysfunctional financial system such that the, there is no, all the inducements are not for banks and financial institutions to lend for productive activities, but to use their finance for speculative activities. As you may know, many people in uh, the underdeveloped world, particularly the Chinese, have accused the United States of a um, uh, implicitly protectionist policy by its expansion of the money supply, it's now called quantitative uh, easing, and this is purpose, of the, uh, the consequence of this, the argument goes, is to drive down the value of the dollar and to make the United States more competitive. I think that's wrong. I think what is correct is that the uh, quantitative easing has put a lot of money in circulation which was used to speculate on bonds, particularly in Western Europe. So banks suddenly have a tremendous amount of liquidity and they were using it for speculative purposes. I'll come back to that in just a moment talk about Western Europe. Uh, 
So Galbraith and others argue that only a fundamental reform of the financial system will lead to a sustained recovery in the United States. Uh, I, I agree with that. However, I think a, um, what can appear as recovery will occur and is occurring. It's just a recovery which reproduces that great emphasis upon unproductive activities rather than productive activities and will extend it. For the Italian, the only big country other than Britain which had a uh, uh, dysfunctional financial system was Spain, where the Spanish banks were engaged in substantial speculative activities, including in the U.S. housing market, the famous subprime market. But the central problem in Europe has been trade imbalances, not fiscal imbalances. I think uh, uh, when I was uh, here about uh, 15 months ago, I gave a paper in which I demonstrated that, and I, uh, anyone wants to say read an article about it, um, in the January issue of the Review of Political Economy, an article on the Euro crisis that demonstrates this. Basically, the, in, the, in 2000, Germany had a trade balance close to zero. And so did every other major country in the European Union, except for Spain, which had a surplus. 2010, Germany had a trade surplus of 450 billion euro. All other members of the Eurozone have a trade deficit of 375 billion euro, and the two track each other almost exactly. The reason that the German surplus is larger than the deficit of the other countries is, of course, it trades with a lot of <coughs> non-European, non-euro countries such as Britain and runs a surplus. Basically, the problem in Europe was German mercantilism. People say, oh, the Germans are more efficient. The Italians are lazy and they just sit around in cafes and drink coffee and they don't work. Uh, they have an inflexible labor market. Um, can't fire people, can't hire people. Uh, all of this, there's no, almost no empirical evidence to support that. We know why the Germans generated their trade surplus. The leader of the Social Democratic Party in Germany spoke in London uh, about uh, uh, four months ago in, uh, at the German embassy, and I went along, and he said, the reason we have a trade surplus is, one, we froze real wages. Other countries didn't freeze real wages, and their wages went up, and their costs went up, and I didn't. Second, we transferred all, if you, we changed the tax system such that if you exported You are exonerated of virtually all your taxes in as far as you export it. And the specific way that that was done is it transferred what are called payroll taxes. Those are, those are the taxes that pay for um, uh, retirement and unemployment compensation. That was changed into value-added taxes. And if you exported, you didn't have to pay value-added tax on what you exported. This is not um, a very sophisticated way of generating a trade surplus. It's called mercantilism, and the German government has been very good at it for almost 70 years. It's just more obvious now. Greece was hit first because it had both a trade surplus and a fiscal deficit. 
Italy, you know, Berlusconi, Berlusconi, uh, some of you may have heard of him, he was Prime Minister of uh, Italy when he was uh, chasing around after adolescent girls. Um, when, just before he fell from power, he said, the European Union is trying to force me out. There is no Italian financial crisis. This demonstrates, principle, that even liars can tell the truth occasionally. Though the problem is, of course, trying to decide when they're telling the truth and when they aren't. The reason he was telling the truth is that actually, when he fell from power, the real Italian debt was no larger than it had been 20 years before. The real in the sense that price deflated Italian debt. And the interest payments on his debt, which at the end of the 1990s had been about 7% of GNP, yes, 7% of GNP, when Berlusconi was forced in power, uh, had fallen to 3%. This is a purely ideological crisis manifested in the form of a neoliberal argument that what is a trade deficit actually reflects a fiscal deficit. Finally, Spain, Spain in some ways is the most grotesque case. In 2008, the Spanish government was running the largest fiscal surplus in Europe. It had the smallest debt as a share of GNP of any major country in Europe, including Germany. And its dramatic increase in the debt, it still has a debt below the level of most European countries, was a result of recapitalizing the banks, the Spanish banks, which had lost considerably during the, uh, through the U.S. prime uh, <coughs> uh, uh, mortgage crisis. Okay. So what did those banks do with the money when they were recapitalized? The Spanish government issued bonds, issued its bonds, to recapitalize the Spanish banks. And the Spanish banks used the money to speculate on those bonds. And so they drove the interest rate in Spain up from about 3% to about 7% in one year. This is a demonstration of an old English saying, not Oscar Wilde, a bit older, saying, no good deed goes unpunished. So the Spanish government did a good deed for the banks, and the banks punished them for it. Okay, finish up. What can we do about it? What are the steps to reform and recovery? First, we need to return to a policy of full employment, that governments will commit themselves to, a, to pursuing policies of full employment, which of course must be constrained by inflationary pressures and balance of payment circumstances. But the, the central policy is full employment. The situation we have now is that you try to achieve fiscal and balance of payments, uh, uh, sustainability, and low inflation, and hope that full employment will result, or not hope, or not care. Point is, we need to emphasize full employment. Second, something must be done about finance, and I think that there are only two uh, effective possibilities. At my college at the University of London, a high advisor to the, uh, the Bank of England came and spoke just before the, um, the uh, governor of the Bank of England changed. One person left. Canadian came into his place. <clears throat> so this man who spoke to us, he had been chief advisor to the uh, head of the British Central Bank. He could speak relatively um, openly because 
his days were numbered. He said, we have a, a major initiative to regulate the financial sector. He said, it will be ineffective. He said, the, uh, in the U.S., the um, uh, financial regulation bill passed by uh, in Obama's first year, I think it was, has been ineffective. And the reason it's ineffective is that the, all of these different financial products and offshore uh, financial centers make it almost impossible to regulate finance domestically. So therefore, I think that the only solution is the nationalization, actually the government takes over the financial sector, or the mutualization. And what that means is you allow for private finance, but you prohibit it from making a profit. That's um, the famous U.S. Savings and Loan Associations of the British um, uh, Building Societies operated on that basis and operate very successfully. They could lend, they could borrow, they could not make a profit. Third, labor rights. I mean, really, really the reason we're in all this mess is because the decline of the trade union movement uh, in Western Europe and the United States, which made it possible to eliminate most of the protections that a labor-based social democratic movement had brought about in the uh, 1930s and then Europe in the 1950s. Command la uh, labor rights are gender, ethnic, and religious rights, and those I include not because they're nice things, which they are, not because we should, but because they will be crucial to the redistribution of wealth uh, and income. The <coughs> part of our problem in Western Europe, but particularly the United States, particularly the Anglo-Saxon country, Britain and the United States, um, the, is a high degree of inequality which does depress demand. In the past, uh, I argued against such what I call underconsumptionist positions, but now the situation has become so extreme that it actually is the case that there's a tendency for inadequate consumption throughout the economy. Okay, I've kept you quite a long time. I would say to um, uh, the people around my age here, let's all hope that we see the improvement um, while we're still around. And to the young people, I would say, it's really up to you to bring it about. Thank you. I think uh, uh, 
Uh, Marx gives us a good explanation, not just Marx. By the way, I should say, as a quick aside, Marx has tremendous insights. You do not have to accept the labor theory of value to draw major insights from Marx. You do not have to come to the conclusion that, you know, that the world is going to be ruled by the proletariat to understand, uh, <coughs> to get, gain understanding. He made the following distinction between uh, somewhat old-fashioned language, between what he called the concentration of production and the centralization of production. Concentration of production is a process by which individual production units, individual companies, grow larger through their um, accumulated profits. So they, buy, uh, they produce things, they sell them, they get profits, they expand. The centralization process involves some companies, companies taking over others. Now, as long as there is no uh, substantial financial sector, or the financial sector is not focused on productive activities, which say, was the case in the early part of the 19th century, companies are for the most part limited to the concentration of capital. That is, the way they expand is by using their own profits. What the banking system does is it resolves that problem, or if you were want to be a Galian to see we've got a constant we've got a contradiction here. Uh, capitalist production wants to expand, however, expansion is based on profits, and <coughs> profits limited its expansion. The way you get around that is that the more profitable companies borrow from the bank, and what they're doing in effect is they are extracting resources or they're reallocating resources from the declining companies to themselves. Though you may not be able to observe that because if there is um, uh, unemployment, for example, you don't, they don't need to take away the labor of uh, the declining sectors. So what the financial sector should do is it should facilitate the expansion of the profitable sectors in the capitalist society through the allocation of credit. Now, the problem arises is banks make money without doing anything productive. But what they're doing is useful because it allows capitalist enterprises to expand more than their profits allow them. But it's essentially an unproductive uh, uh, activity. The bank doesn't produce anything, it doesn't transport anything. Uh, and, uh, what it does is an important task and a non-productive one. With deregulation, banks increasingly, finance becomes the dominant over, um, uh, over production. So we need banks, but we need them in a form in which they're forced to engage with the productive sector of the economy. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. To ask to your perspective, uh, uh, to the result of this the operation of the system, the capitalist system, when looking to get the results that you mentioned, have you said anything uh, with regards to the property ownership and the, uh, the mode of production, etc.? Could we did really get all these results? With the same kind of economic system and the, and the uh, production system and, and the base system. Thank you. I'm glad you asked that question. <coughs> you no, know, not very. Uh, okay. I mean, this is a question of political practice. What should be our focus? And I'll make two points. One is, you are quite right. Uh, I've been interviewed uh, several times on um, the Real News Network about finance uh, and these video interviews. And um, when I make the type of argument I make today, uh, the interviewer always asks me, how do you expect it to change as long as financial capital is so powerful? And not only is it powerful that uh, financial capital in the United States, at any rate, and the great extent in Europe, 
has rewritten the rules such that they're very difficult, financial capital is very difficult to regulate. That's true. So what is the vehicle for doing something about that? Well, yes, I mean, one, uh, one method is to um, uh, have a fundamental transformation of the system. That leaves my second point. I would say the approach to that, in order to do it in a different, different democratic way, we must pass through a period in which you have uh, basically social democratic focus, similar to the reconstruction of the social democratic consensus uh, uh, in Europe after World War II. Then, if there is support for going further, then we should do that. I think, um, and this is just an opinion, um, I think an actual um, non-democratic, or you want to call it violent, or uh, whatever, process by which the United States or um, Western European countries would be uh, transformed is unlikely, and I'm not sure that it would be a good idea. The only exception, I would say, is Greece, where you could well have a um, anti-democratic seizure power in Greece, but it would be by the right, not by the left. I feel like we can stop here. Okay. We'll have a little break on that. All right. Thanks very much. Thank you.